Hi everyone, in this video we're going to be discussing the elements of visual communication. In much the same way that we can verbalize our thinking using written language, we can also visualize our thinking using visual language. Uh, the elements of an image represent concepts spatially rather than the linear form that we're typically used to in writing. You've all heard the expression, an image is worth a thousand words. Well, we want to talk about how can we begin to leverage that principle when working in our accordion books. So our goal is to use key elements of visual communication to give form to our thinking and learning while using our accordion books and ultimately in our posters. First, let's talk about the elements of visual communication that we're going to focus on in this video. Words, text, lettering, and type, lines and shapes, then color, repetition and variation, and finally, orientation, scale, and proportion. So let's dive in talking about words, text, lettering, and type. It's our dominant mode of recording and capturing information. We're all very comfortable writing, but we wanna talk a little bit about some of the visual aspects of writing or the written word. This example from John Baldessari uses his handwriting and repeats, I will not make any more boring art over and over and over again. T uh, text written in this way is not super legible, but it definitely conveys a feeling of some sort of personal connection. This is probably what most of the initial notes in our accordion books are going to look like. Uh, this piece here by Mel Bachner, it, you can see that we get a little bit more expressive with the way that he's using type, and it tends to have a very different feel than the handwriting. In The Treachery of Images by René Magritte, we have the text, Si n'est pas une pipe, and uh, it's a much more sort of clean sign painter style of writing that makes it much more legible. Kind of reminds you of the way that you might see text written in a children's book. It's a little bit better for communication than the first example we saw. And then we have more type-based treatments in this work by Barbara Kruger. She's borrowing the type treatments typically used in advertising to be critical of advertising and the way that we're being marketed to. Finally, in this piece here by Margaret Kilgallen, you can see a much more sort of traditional sign painter style approach to text. The way that we treat words, text, and images in our book when we're taking notes or when we're trying to give form to our ideas can vary greatly. And, and by adding a layer of thought to how you render your words, we can improve the visual impact that those things have in our book. All right, let's talk about lines and shapes. Lines the path that is created when an object moves from one point to another. Lines can be made or implied. They can be vertical or horizontal, thick or thin, light, dark, complex, simple, dashed, dotted, rough, smooth, zigzagged. Lines come in lots of different shapes and sizes and can be used for very different effects. Take a look at these two examples by two radically different artists. On the left, you have a drawing by Vincent van Gogh, and on the right, a drawing by Jean-Michel Basquiat. And you can see that they each use line very, very differently whilst describing a similar subject. Both of them are drawing human heads, and the way that they use line can radically change the way that we perceive the drawing itself or the form that's being represented. When you throw color into the mix, we still have Van Gogh on the left and Basquiat on the right. It totally changes the way that those lines feel, adding elements of contrast and differentiation through the use of color that can really add to the way that we feel those lines. Keith Haring is really well known for his big, bold use of line to be able to define shape. He also pairs that with big, bold color, and, and the effect that he often creates is one where we understand that his figures are in motion or radiating or glowing in some way, shape, or form, simply by the way he pairs line, shape, and color. In this work by Maya Hayek, you can begin to see how the long lines start to form shapes and blocks of color that become pattern. Taken even further in this work here by Kristen Farr, you can see how pairing repeated shapes with the use of color can begin to create an illusion of folding or depth uh, with this star shape composition on the side of the building. Next, we want to talk a little bit about color. Specifically, we're going to talk about contrast, color relationships, and color associations. Color is present when light strikes an object and is reflected back into the eye. This traditional 12-spoke color wheel may look kind of familiar and simple, but its roots go all the way back to the mid to late 1600s and began with the work of Sir Isaac Newton. To arrive at this version of the color wheel that you see here, it's taken a lot of collaboration between both artists and scientists over the years to be able to fully understand how color works and operates. This is an example of what one of 
Newton's earliest color wheel drawings look like. It didn't even include color. It was simply a black and white rendering to help him understand how he thought color functioned. And he is credited as being one of the first people to orient the color spectrum as a wheel. The color wheel is sort of the standard tool for visualizing and understanding color across all of art and design. This color wheel is based on the three primary colors, red, yellow, and blue, along with the secondary colors of green, orange, and purple. This color wheel also shows the transitional colors that exist between those six key colors, and you can see them labeled here. So the outermost ring of this color wheel shows hue. The hue represents each color in its purest form. The next ring in is tint. It's the lighter value of a color that is blended with white. Next ring in demonstrates tone, which is a color that has been blended with gray, and the innermost ring shows a shade of a color, which is the color mixed with black. So when we pull out, you can see the full color wheel, you can see its hue, its tint, its tone, and its shade. Each pie-shaped section of the color wheel is often referred to as a color family. Color families are monochromatic, like these shades here of yellow-green. This version of the color wheel situates the colors on a 360 degree spectrum. It's been divided into the warm and cool colors, and here you can see that things that happen at zero degrees are the absolute warmest colors in the color spectrum. Things that happen at the 180 degree mark are the absolute coolest colors that happen in this color spectrum, and the colors at 90 and 270 degrees represent the sort of transitional colors between warm and cool. It's often harder to tell if a color is warm or cool, the closer it gets to that midline. Let's talk about how that looks on the color wheel we were using before. If we divide our color wheel along this axis, then we can divide these into warm and cool colors. Understanding the difference between warm and cool colors is going to be super helpful for your mentees when it comes to dealing with things like temperature in our uh, science content. Additionally, it's also helpful to understand that warm colors tend to advance or feel close to us while well, cool colors tend to recede or feel more distant from us. Take a look at this work here by Cezanne and the still life, and you can see the way that those warm fruits tend to punch forward and feel round when contrasted with the cool values in the background. One of the key things to understand about color that we can leverage is understanding color contrast. And one of the easiest ways to begin to create color contrast is by pairing complementary colors together. I want to take a second here to talk a little bit about complementary colors and how the color wheel works. Complementary colors or opposites are located, as it might sound, opposite of each other on the color wheel. Orange and green, blue, yellow and violet, Green and red are all examples of some of the key complementary colors, but if you're ever wondering what color is the complement to another color, it's the color directly across from it on the color wheel. So like our earlier example of yellow and violet or blue and orange being paired next to each other, these two colors when paired will th make things feel like they are popping or create a kind of visual energy or vibration. Similarly, you can also create color contrast by pairing light colors with dark colors. So you can use value to help create a feeling of contrast. A lot of the times in our accordion books and in our posters, we can use contrast to illustrate change over time or difference. Finally, we have some really strong associations with color and color becomes symbol in our daily life. Red can signify love or stop depending on its context. Similarly, yellow could be representative of the sunshine or slowing down when it comes to a traffic light. Green might be a symbol for the environment or for recycling, or it might mean go. Orange we associate with construction or caution. Colors in our daily life function very symbolically and they communicate a lot of information very, very quickly just by their mere presence. We've all made that trip to our local home improvement store and browsed through the color swatches. And if you've ever browsed through them, then you know that colors are often named for the things that they remind us of. This set of colors could be all about bubble gum, cotton candy, or lollipops. So we can leverage color to play on its associations. If we want a color can become symbolic in our book. It can become a way to code our information, or it can become stand-in for an entire concept. Next, I want to take a second to talk about repetition and variation. In this work by Bridget Riley, she's simply repeating a line over and over and over again, but it's subtle 
shift and curve repeated over the entire space of the drawing begins to create an illusion or, of warping or bending. Julie Mertu uses repetition and variation to great effect in her large scale dynamic paintings where she can create a feeling of movement or rushing inward, uh, almost like a feeling of a storm of color moving through this canvas simply by repeating and varying the same element. In this painting by Rene Magritte, he can evoke a feeling of rain by reproducing and repeating a simple figure over and over and over again across the sky. And finally, in these drawings by da Vinci, we can see how he's using the same repeated curving stroke to try to evolve his understanding of how fluid mechanics works or how water moves. Next, I want to take a second to talk about orientation, scale, and proportion. In this painting by Rene Magritte, the apple is situated smack dab in the center and is drawn proportionately extremely large compared to the rest of the room, having a surreal kind of an impact on the viewer, as opposed to this painting by Hopper, where the scale of the figures relative to the scale of the buildings and the rest of the painting feel really small, heightening a feeling of isolation. This painting by Mary Cassatt zooms us up close and personal with the subject and creates a feeling of emotional closeness by making them very large in relationship to the overall painting. So we can leverage how we use scale, proportion, and placement in our books to be able to change the way that we perceive the information being presented. Large concepts, important concepts can be rendered larger and less important supporting details can be rendered smaller.